Thank you, Drea. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, you can only hear me. Hopefully I can get on Zoom uh, sometime in the next few minutes. I'm having computer problems. But I wanna welcome all of you to the St. Louis chapter meeting, annual meeting of CGS. Uh, Citizens for Global Solutions has been around for many decades promoting democratic world federation. And the um, St. Louis chapter has been around since the 1960s. And for most of those years, Ron Glossop was the chair. And I uh, was told that Ron is on our, our call today. So thank you, Ron, for all the years in which you led the St. Louis chapter. And for many years, the St. Louis chapter has had uh, annual meetings. And uh, right now, we are going to uh, continue, if we can, to have those on Zoom. And our um, special guest speaker today is Rebecca Shute, who is the CGS Executive Director. She's an international lawyer and democracy and governance practitioner with more than 15 years of experience in the non-governmental, intergovernmental, and private sectors supporting human rights, democratic processes, and the rule of law on five continents. In nearly a decade with the National Democratic Institute, Rebecca held numerous positions and headquarters in the field supporting and leading democracy and governance programs in Central and Eastern Europe and Southern and East Africa. She subsequently moved to a leadership role steering NDI's governance projects globally and directing programming for the bipartisan House Democracy Partnership of the U.S. House of Representatives. Rebecca created a global parliamentary campaign for democratic renewal and human rights as senior advisor to Parliamentarians for Global Action, an international network of legislatures committed to collaboration to promote democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Prior to that, she directed PGA's International Law and Human Rights Program and ran the PGA's office in The Hague. Most recently, Rebecca helmed global programming to promote gender equality and criminal justice reform by the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. Rebecca is admitted to practice law in the District of Columbia and is a member of several bar associations, including the American branch of the International Law Association, where she serves as advocacy director for the International Criminal Court Committee. Rebecca has spoken at high-level conferences and events on five continents. Alongside her work as Executive Director of CGS, Rebecca, Rebecca is the co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court, a diverse coalition of human rights organizations, legal associations, former government officials, and leading legal professionals. And so it's my honor now to uh, introduce to you Rebecca Shute, she will speak to us about not an ultimate goal, but an immediate necessity, the past, present, and future of CGS's advocacy for Democratic World Federation. Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much, David. I admit I'm a little bit embarrassed by that fulsome introduction, knowing who else is on the call, um, including uh, many of my heroes in this movement, many people who have been working towards Democratic World Federation far longer than I. Um, um, some of them have been al alive far longer than I. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure, but moreover a privilege to be with you today. Um, at about the one year mark since I joined CGS as executive director. And I would also just like to um, have a special moment of appreciation for the St. Louis chapter. We're joined, I think, not only from individuals from St. Louis, but from around the country. And indeed, I see a few of our friends from around the globe, um, including our partners and, and team members, uh, and just showing in the ways in which uh, our community continues to grow. But the St. Louis chapter has been one of our most active chapters and indeed has paved the way for what we are now doing on the national level, including, for example, with a student essay contest that nurtures the next generation of uh, world federalists and encourages global thinking uh, among young people. You'll hear more about that and about other grassroots concrete programming, um, much of which you can get involved with 
when I yield my time to my dear colleagues, Drea Klein-Bergman, the Director of Programs, and uh, James Lowell May, our uh, Program Officer, who's joining us all the way from Belgrade, Serbia. And so I'll spend my time, um, if, I, if you'll indulge me, on a more macro level, um, reflecting on the uh, theme of this talk, the not an ultimate goal, but an immediate necessity. So those words were spoken by one of the founders of the Democratic World Federalist Movement, Democratic World Federation Movement, Emery Reeves, um, a literary agent for Winston Churchill and other prominent European statement who are predominantly anti-fascist and held democratic ideals. And this was at what the apex, um, what many would call an apex um, of our movement in the post-war period. Um, however, I'm here to argue and make the case that CGS and our movement as a whole has never been more relevant than it is today. And I'll give you some concrete um, and hopefully inspirational examples of why. So while this talk is entitled Past, Present and Future, um, I think that many of you could uh, lecture me far better on, on the past and the illustrious successes of our movement. And I made the mistake earlier of using slides in a recent presentation where I got a date wrong. So I'm not doing that this time um, because I know that there are those in the audience who will be able to call me out on that level of minutia because that's how deeply we care and that's how, um, uh, how uh, firm our memories are. Um, but, you know, it is it, it does feel like hubris sometimes to stand on the shoulders of these giants. Um, and of course, we all know the founding fathers and mothers of our movement. Um, I will therefore not go into the case of why World Federation for this audience, because I believe that I would be preaching to the choir or perhaps a little bit of an echo chamber. And again, I think you could add to that chorus far better than I am. Um, so instead, I want to share with you how we are, to extend the metaphor, if you'll indulge me, uh, reaching into new conference halls and uh, joining with us, uh, perhaps a richer array of harmonizing voices. And here, um, at the big picture level, I see a threefold approach. Meeting the moment, making the moment, and maximizing the moment. And these very well interplay with one another, they're intersectional and perhaps a little bit um, of a rhetorical device to frame them in that threefold pattern. Um, but I think it gives us a way to introduce or um, engage with CGS's current priorities um, at a global level and then connect those to the grassroots level and the work that we can do across the country, um, which Andrea and James will follow me with. Um, so in terms of the meeting the moment, this comes to the responsiveness to the poly crises that the world is undergoing. Um, we know that our movement and our organization were founded out of a fundamental appreciation of the existential challenges our planet has, is facing. And never has that been more true, or I think that awareness more palpable and widely shared than today. And I'll give you two examples um, of how I think one one large and one um, acute um, of how I think that we are meeting the moment. So we have launched two new flagship programs uh, since I became executive director. And John, I'm, I'm really happy you're on the call, but also correct me if I get anything wrong in terms of my talking points on the first, which is one one, if perhaps <laughs> our uh, highest priority, which is the Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance. So we formally launched this after a period of incubation and a period of development with two co-hosting partners, the Climate Governance Commission and the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy in March um, in Geneva as an answer to the challenges faced by Earth's integrated ecosystems. And while there are many, many, um, uh, and ever, it seems more um, multi, uh, multiplicitous and multifarious, different kinds of solutions for um, uh, unique um, climate issues or unique environmental crises, there has not been a holistic system that is uh, attempted to tackle at the governance level, at the global governance level. 
And so recognizing the planetary emergency, MEGA, um, as it's called in short, and Dre is always, yep, thank you. You're already on it with the links. I really appreciate that. Um, MEGA uh, seeks to have a global planetary response. Um, at the moment, the platform, um, and the platform uh, is not just an online website, but uh, seeks to be a forum for convocation of numerous uh, multi-sectoral actors who are working on innovative challenges. Um, the platform features 24 proposals. Uh, there are short, medium, and long-term goals and proposals to accompany each. Um, I might actually put John on the spot in a minute, um, but uh, just just because I know that he would love to speak to some of this, I think. Um, but it is a big tent coalition um, that brings together not only civil society actors and like-minded uh, states and member states, as we have previously done with such coalitions as the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, but also now reaching out to academia, to the private sector, um, and uh, to science and technology. Um, activists and um, specialists to ensure that the global governance solutions are fit to purpose, because um, I know that many of you are familiar with the model of why Democratic World Federation, if there's a plan A, if there's a plan B, what happens in plan B, if there's a, a cataclysmic crisis or a catastrophe, we are at the catastrophic level with regards to the planet that we call home. And if we do not have a global governance response that uh, is not delimited to national boundaries, is not delimited to partisan politics, then we cannot meet that moment. So um, I, I will just open the floor for one second to John Blasto um, if he wants to make a comment on MEGA before I move on to my next talking point. Um. I don't think I do have a comment really. It's a really nice summary. I'm really here just to to see how CGS presents itself and for myself to get an overview because I'm so in the thick of things. I'm rather lost. So uh, I'm finding this very clarifying. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, John. Um, so mega is as big a picture as you can think, but um, when we get to our programming discussion, we will talk about the ways in which this trickles down and that anybody, any CGS member, any potential CGS member, any member of your community can potentially get involved with this or another initiative. When I move to my next point on meeting the moment, I'm going to go from the macro and um, very big picture, very long term um, um, although the, you know we have short-term goals there, this has been long in its um, gestation as a, a priority for CGS to a way in which we respond in and of the moment. Um, so over the course of the last two weeks, you will have heard in my introduction that I'm also the co-convener of the Washington Working Group for the International Criminal Court, and obviously CGS and WFM um, and our partners were uh, leading foundational members of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. In the last two weeks, the ICC has faced unprecedented, perhaps, threats from Congress. We've seen this before from the executive branch of government, with the former administration placing sanctions on two uh, key court officials. Um, now there has been a movement um, in the legislative branch of government uh, to uh, preemptively perhaps sanction or threaten um, international jurists and administrators of a, a court um, for their involvement in certain prospective potential cases and situations. And um, I believe this uh, is an attack not only on the International Criminal Court, but on a system of international justice where all cases and situations should be pursued with independence um, and with the full mobility of their um, uh, of the indispensable staff who take great risk to um, find accountability and realize the promise um, that I will get to again in a moment of law not war that our founding member and national advisory council member who passed last year ben Benjamin Ferenz believed in. Okay, so moving then to making the moment. Um, I, I am reminded of Ben Ferenc's quote, 
There can be no peace without justice, no justice without law, and no meaningful law without court to decide what is just and lawful under any given circumstance. So to this point, this year is the 125th anniversary of the first Hague Peace Conference. And we launched uh, last year, last October, a legal alternatives to war campaign to promote the universality and effectiveness of the International Court of Justice. Now, if I probably talked to many folks uh, about a year ago about the International Court of Justice, I might have gotten blank stares, where now I see some spark of awareness and I see um, uh, a, a inkling of um, understanding, if not necessarily appreciation of the work of the ICJ, given its prominence on several genocide cases, several cases on um, um, territorial jurisdiction, and uh, several on, uh, and one in particular on the uh, responsibility and obligations of states with regards to climate change. And the latter is a wonderful example of the people powered nature of a movement that I think is very much in kind with CGS's ethos and success over its multi decade history. Here you had a um, mostly youth-led grassroots movement calling upon states for action with regards to climate change. You ultimately got to the UN General Assembly for a debate where unanimously there was a referral to the International Court of Justice, the foundational uh, judicial institution of the UN and global uh, governance system architecture. Um, and now the court is seized of that issue. There are companion cases in other courts and tribunals, um, some very, um, uh, I would say revolutionary almost, uh, decisions have recently come out of the European Court of Human Rights, for instance, and the Inter International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is also contemplating similar questions um, with regards to um, the, uh, um, its jurisdiction over over oceans and um, aquatic uh, uh, aquatic global commons. Um, our campaign law not war, and I I, uh, I apologize to those of you who had to see a certain talking head um, um, blabbing off about this on a certain crowdfunding campaign, but we'll still include the link, even though I think the crowdfunding campaign ha has officially closed. Um, the Law Network campaign seeks to increase universality of the International Court of Justice. So currently the International Court of Justice, which is uh, its jurisdiction is over disputes among, among and between states, only has compulsory jurisdiction over 74 states that have filed a declaration. It also seeks to help small states that want to bring disputes before the court, but might not have the resources to do so. So, for example, um, a, a small Pacific island nation that is literally facing extinction um, because of climate crisis um, and because of the acts of neighbors or big powers, um, that is a case that we would like to offer pro bono support for. And we draw on the vast experience and expertise of an array of partners, um, including those who have brought to cases before the court on nuclear weapons testing and the legality thereof of nuclear weapons. Um, I'll say one more point uh, about the International Court of Justice. Um, it is a court that the United States has supported. The outgoing president is an American. She is now the incoming honorary president of the American Society of International Law. However, uh, we do not see that solidarity, of course, against uh, across all courts and tribunals. And so the universality of justice and the complementarity of the system of, of law with the ICJ, ICC, which I can talk to, and I imagine there might be questions on that, with regional and domestic jurisdictions is paramount. And here we have been working um, behind the scenes um, a bit with the current US administration, the current ambassador for global criminal justice as a friend of international law, this may not be the case in several months. Um, and well, I would like to welcome everybody to our annual meeting in um, DC, which we hope to have in November um, in hybrid form.
and I'd like to welcome you in person. Um, we're all obviously seized of the challenges that may be posed to a global governance system. Um, I also should just briefly mention in terms of making the moment um, that we are actively involved in helping support a Crimes Against Humanity Treaty at the global level, which our National Advisory Council member Leila Sadat, Professor Leila Sadat from Washington University in St. Louis, um, has led on. Um, as well as domestic legislation um, rendering crimes against humanity an independent crime under federal law. Um, in terms of maximizing the moment, um, I will speak here to the Summit of the Future process and the processes of um, UN reform that are currently underway. So the Summit of the Future had originally been envisioned by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres um, as a companion to the SDG summit in 2023. However, um, following somewhat acrimonious negotiations with member states, the decision was made to delay it for a year. What that meant in terms of the extended time frame is still rushed, um, still hurried, still very chaotic, um, but attenuated process during which civil society and multilateral um, uh, forces could come together to try to envision what a truly reformed um, and revitalized and reimagined UN system could mean. And so John and I have just returned from a civil society summit that was held at kind of the midpoint of the SDG summit and the summit of the future in Nairobi, Kenya very important that this was held in the global south. And um, this was hailed, or this whole process has been hailed as a once in a generation opportunity for true UN reform. However, the degree to, that to which that materializes is very much uh, predicated on how much we maximize the moment. The key outcome of the uh, Nairobi Civil Society Conference was the formulation of at this point 20, although they may coalesce and uh, reform in, in, in different amalgamations, impact coalitions. Um, and these range on everything from AI to um, culture and uh, arts um, for formative change to those that are kind of nearer and dearer to CGS and our movement's hearts. We co-lead on three. Um, those are the Earth Governance Coalition, which was closely aligned with MEGA, the um, flagship campaign I led with, the Just Institutions and International Court of Justice uh, Impact Coalition, closely aligned with um, the Law Not War campaign that I mentioned, and also the International Anti-Corruption Court Initiative. And if anybody's very interested in anti-corruption, I could do a whole nother hour on that alone. So would love to have an uh, opportunity to speak about that with you. We also support several others. We can't co-convene everything, um, partly because of human capacity um, and the inability to clone myself and my dear colleagues. Um, but these include UN charter reform and inclusive global governance institutions and the rights of future generations. And again, I'd love to follow up with anybody about areas of specific interest um, and where the goals and outcomes are for each of these. Um, I would like to say that um, we know exactly what uh, how we can plug into this process moving forward, but in reality, we are very much um, charting the course and building the ship as we are moving forward. We just know that this is a moment that um, is perhaps of greater resonance than at any time um, that I can think of since perhaps the coalition for the ICCs uh, coming together um, and the ways in which civil society raveled, ra rallied around that, or maybe even going back to our foundational years in the post-war period and the imagining of what a UN could be. Um, I'll, I'll close with um, a quote that I offered for a peace walk that was held on the sidelines of the Nor Nairobi conference that I think it, it, it was meant to be quite literal about a 
walking with a the first run uh, woman who uh, ran uh, first African woman to win the New York Marathon. But I think it could be extrapolated to our greater enterprise. And so we walk because we can, and for those who cannot, we, for those who have come before us and those who will come after, committing that every footfall will take us one step closer to a more just, inclusive, sustainable, and equitable future. And so with that, I think I will end my opening remarks, and I'm much more interested in having a conversation with all of you um, and also um, engaging with our programs team in the wonderful work that they are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for those uh, insightful remarks. Um, let's now have some questions for Rebecca. And if I don't see any immediately, I can give her one myself. There's some in the chat. Yeah. Yes, there's two, so, in, the two in the chat as well. Terry, you had two in the chat? Yeah. Okay, why don't you ask those to Rebecca? Okay, first one is, uh, what is the status of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? And can that help if it gets farther? Um, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, and this is not my area of expertise, but I'll answer as best I can. Um, like many agreements, treaties, um, uh, or other um, uh, transnational arrangements um, is, um, in a period of yeah. he's on hold. Um, so uh, Trump withdrew. Uh, so sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll back up. Uh, it's a proposed trade agreement between Pacific Rim countries. Um, and then like many other treaties, we signed it. Uh, the United States signed it and um, did not ratify. There are a lot of reasons why uh, ratification uh, is difficult in the United States, why we're the only country, for example, that has not, even though we proposed it, has not uh, ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And in this case, um, uh, Trump, I know, formally withdrew from the TPP. Um, and then I, I don't, know that it, there has been significant progress under the Biden administration. But again, I can look into this for you and get back. Um, it would be an interesting conversation for some of our partners who are more um, on, uh, who have uh, experience with um, uh, the global financial institutions and global financial networks. And that is also, by the way, another impact coalition. So that would be a really great conversation to have with them about the wither the TPP. Um, and if this is something that our membership is interested in advocating for, um, I would say that it doesn't, um, I, uh, my personal standpoint is that um, it doesn't hurt us to advocate for multiple accessions or ratifications of instra international instruments, that I don't think it confuses the narrative to advocate for a TPP membership the same time that you advocate for ratification of the Rome Statute or um, the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, or any of the other international instruments that the United States um, has not um, signed up to board. Um, I'm sorry, that was probably a very unsatisfactory answer, but it's the best I can give. <laughs> which leads to my second question is about uh, why does the U.S. Uh, support the ICJ and not the ICC? So being one of the foundational members of the uh, UN Charter and, and the UN system, the ICJ was already baked into the system. So the United States, by default, accepts that the ICJ has jurisdiction in certain situations. However, it is not one of the 74 countries, it's not likely to become the 75th country, um, that has accepted jurisdiction, compulsory jurisdiction over contentious disputes. So what that means is that when there is a um, referral by the UN General Assembly or the UN Security Council, the United States is obligated to go to court on that. When there is a treaty wherein the ICJ is um, uh, mentioned, as it is in most international treaties, as the method of adjudication, the United States is obligated to go to court. But when the United States has um, a, a problem with another state, 
we have not accepted that the ICJ will be the default mechanism for uh, resolution of dispute. And I want to come back here to a little bit of CGS lore and history, um, which is that in 1984, the seminal case of um, Nicaragua v. U.S., um, is seen by many as a failure of international law and an instance of non-compliance. This was when Nicaragua took us to court over our funding of Contras and um, our interference with their national sovereignty. And at that point, the United States government um, said it would not comply and declared the International Court of Justice illegitimate, even while still being uh, subject to its jurisdiction, as I, I previously mentioned. However, what then came about was, if you look into the longer story, was um, a fundamental awakening and awareness raising that this practice was going on of funding contrast. And a, I would say a political shift um, in the United States and also, by the way, our predecessor organization, we weren't called CGS then, but was the name among the name plaintiffs that took the Department of Justice to court in the Fifth Circuit, challenging their non-compliance with this decision. And so that is just such, and um, David Gallup, one of our board members um, sent me a, um, and I can uh, share this with everybody, a, a newspaper clipping from that moment. And it just gave me shivers to think about um, how you know we were in front of this um, at that time and hopefully carrying on that legacy now. So that's the long answer to the, the ICJ. Um, the ICC is a, also a very, 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 very long answer. And um, we can have our um, uh, National Advisory Council member, um, David Sheffer, who is the ambassador at large for war crimes, uh, now styled global criminal justice, who signed the Rome Statute, but then had to deliver the news um, uh, and signed it at the 11th hour on December 31st. Um, uh, literally the between 11 uh, a, a p.m. And, and, and 12 a.m. Um, before it would no longer be open for signature, but had to say that the United States did not have intent at that point to ratify because of our reservations. And our reservations then um, encapsulated in the American Service Members Protection Act um, have to do with a potential, and, and this is rearing its head again, this has not been more timely um, than it is now, um, have to do with the potential prosecution or investigation of um, American um, uh, American service members in, in the course of armed conflict. What that fails to heed is the principle of complementarity. And when I make the case before members of government and policymakers about why uh, one of the cases, why um, uh, the Rome statute ratification is indispensable, if you believe in the principle of complementarity, which holds that a uh, the ICC may only proceed on criminal proceed uh, in a criminal case if a state is unwilling or unable to um, to investigate or to prosecute. That means that you have a fundamental distrust um, of your um, or or um, that you think that your system is incapable um, of handling um, the crimes under the court's jurisdiction, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression in some cases. Um, yeah. So, um, anyway, sorry, very long answer, <laughs> but I can, I, I, again, we can, we can talk about this all day, Terry. I would love to have a follow-up call with you. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Okay. Hey, Ian Crawford has his hand up. Hi, yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I, I was muted. Hi, yes. I, I'm Ian Crawford. Um, thanks, Rebecca, for this really very interesting summary. Uh, I'm, I'm based in the UK. Um, I, I have a question about the summit of the future. Uh, is it possible for you to expand a little bit on what um, what the WFM CGS input to the summit of the future is likely to be? I mean, it seems important that we couldn't ask for too much and 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 and, and at the same time be realistic. Uh, what 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 kind of things are 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 we likely to um, put into that? to that summit of the future. Uh, thank you, Ian, and thank you for joining us all the way from the UK. 
So there are three foundational guiding documents that are meant to lead the process to and beyond the summit of the future. And I really want to stress that I hope it is beyond, that this is not just a flashpoint, another summit, another conference, but a tipping point. Those three documents that are member state driven are the Pact for the Future, the Global Digital Compact, and the Declaration for Future Generations. Now, as civil society, we have stepped up with companion pieces there too, but most specifically um, the uh, Pact for the Future. So there is currently um, under um, peer review, a People's Pact for the Future that mimics the structure of the pact with five chapters. Um, and uh, Alan Ware, the director of programs, interim executive director of WFM IGP and I were pen holders on the one on peace and security. And what we saw, and so these are working in tandem, the um, the, the pact for the future, the member states driven or uh, document um, went from zero draft to version one while we promulgated the first people's pact for the future. And we tried to have as many civil society, excuse me, member state com conversations with civil society as possible. Um, I'm normally based in DC. I'm coming to you from New York right now. I spent a little bit of time up here because that's where my family's from. So I'm able to get to some of the bilateral conversations, but what was very frustrating um, to use a light word um, is that civil society was largely precluded from the consultations that member states were having amongst themselves on the pact for the future. So even those of us with ECOSOC consultative status as both WFM and CGS have, um, were not allowed to be even in the gallery to observe uh, and so we have relied greatly on our partners at the Coalition for the UN We Need um, and to uh, help facilitate some of these bilateral conversations. So one concrete answer to your question is that we have been very, very deeply involved, many hours spent, many words, um, uh, pen strokes uh, made and um, darlings killed uh, over the Pact for the Future process. Um, then we have these impact coalitions. And as I mentioned, there uh, were 20 of them that uh, came together in Nairobi. That number may wane or wax, um, and uh, they certainly are intersectional and um, need to collaborate with one another. And each of these coalitions seeks to marshal the same energy and the same strategizing that we've had with moving the ICC, for instance, into being. Um, and they each are now in the process, this is what I'm going to do after I get off the phone with you, um, of making work plans with concrete goals uh, that we think are achievable in the short, medium, and long term, and monitor and evaluation now, uh, metrics uh, towards things like, for I could take the example of, um, uh, of just institutions. So if just institutions, I'll have a set of goals around ICJ, I'll have a set of goals around the ICC, I'll have a set of goals around new institutions, including potentially an IACC, a World Court of Human Rights, an environmental court, um, and then around complementarity and cooperation with regional and domestic courts and institutions. And that's only one of 20. Um, and so we could we could unpack each of those. Um, but this takes up, this has been a, a large focus of, of WFM, I can, if I can speak for my counterpart and, and myself. Um, and I do think that we are in the rooms where it happens. And um, if, it, if there will be civil society involvement in impactful future, both of our organizations will be there and will be a part of it. Okay, okay, thanks. Could, could I just ask, is anyone talking about a UN parliamentary assembly? Is this um... absolutely absolutely? So okay. we're very supportive of the UN Parliamentary Assembly proposal. This is currently in Chapter Five of the Pact for the Future, the People's Pact mm -hmm. for the Future, and it's um, in an impact coalition led by Andreas Bommel, unsurprisingly, dear friend, close colleague on inclusive governance institutions. There's also the World Citizens or Global Citizens Assembly proposal um, that is on the table within that same coalition um, because it's a little bit of a big tent, but UNPA is in there. And then um, um, a, a peacekeeping um, 
uh, force or service is also envisioned in chapter two. And I'm happy to um, circulate drafts and, and give more specifics um, under each of these because again, 20 coalitions and a whole lot of recommendations. But yes, we are very, very supportive of the UMPA. Okay, uh, I see John has his hand up, but th th thanks, Rebecca, thank you. John? Uh, I was just gonna comment on, on Ian's question there and, and what Rebecca was saying about UNPA and some of the future. <coughs> I haven't noticed that, that uh, Russia and China are lining up to sign off on the UNPA at the summit of the future. It's not gonna come out of the pact for the future, the official UN output. It certainly features strongly in the People's Pact. Well, it feels to me that the Pact for the Future has done, the Summit of the Future, is it has uh, catalyzed pulling civil society together around global governance, which isn't something that happens all the time. So the Nairobi conference that Rebecca mentioned, we had 2,000, I think, civil society organizations, and the topic was, how do we strengthen the UN? So CGS and WFM have been leaning into that opportunity very strongly. Um, Rebecca, I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, we've all seen many protests on college campuses recently. In light of our World Federalist philosophy, do you think they're protesting the right thing? Well, I don't think that any protest or demonstration is monolithic. So I don't know the personal motivations for every person there. I do, we do see the news reports about the ways in which things are depicted um, and the overall messaging seems to be sometimes superimposed after the fact um, by outside observers, as opposed to perhaps by those who are leading it. What I think within our movement we offer folks is a way for hopefully um, a peaceful movement towards systemic change, um, not just on one issue, but on the totality of a system that is fundamentally weighted against uh, certain, uh, certain individuals, certain nations, uh, and certain points of view. I think Donna has her hand up. I have my hand up as an as a individual, not as a uh, board member of Citizens for Global Solution to answer that question. But um, I was of the generation that protested the Vietnam War when I was in college. And at that time, we were called anti-American. We were yelled at, get out of the country if you don't like what we're doing. Um, we were not anti-American. Uh, you know, I'm not sure where what, what was at the, what I hear now about this, the, the student protesters that they're anti-Semitic and my favorite response was when NPR was interviewing a student and said, well, why are you anti-Semitic? And the student said, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm Jewish. I'm, I, I just don't want the killing to stop. So uh, I'm just grateful that students are protesting again. We've got to end the war system. And if you don't get people protesting about war, then it just never ends. It just keeps going on. So that's my personal opinion. No, no official role there. But. And I think this is a perfect example of where the grassroots um, uh, people powered movement that CGS has, is, and will be can come together with our, our role in speaking to corridors of power. Um, being able to, and so I've been involved in many countries and um, worked uh, with, we have a wonderful expert on the line and the person of James May, um, who's worked with youth in peaceful protesting in um, very difficult circumstances um, in, in post-conflict and current conflict settings. Um, and so inspiring that kind of action in a structured way, in a constructive way, at the same time that we're doing things like working with Liechtenstein on uh, proposals to delimit the use of the veto um, in in cases of atrocity crimes and aggression, um, as as we're doing. Um, so uh, trying to solve the UN system from within and the ways in which member states are abusing or misusing it, 
and then uh, uh, from the very fundamental grassroots level. I'm cognizant that we only have, uh, so sorry, from the grassroots level, inspiring the younger generation and trying to give them the courage that I don't think they need from us. They seem to have buckets of it on their own um, and to continue making their voices heard in, uh, and uh, fully utilizing their freedom of expression for peaceful causes. Um, so with that, I'm cognizant that we have only 13 minutes left, and we do have a presentation from our programs team that I think this would be a nice segue into, um, uh, being as it's the next generation and how we are trying to support um, the young CGS members, potential CGS members, folks who are just advocating for change in the world. So with that, over to Drea and James. Thanks, Rebecca. Actually, we are going to start with our youth programming, so this could be more apropos. Um, and again, my name is Drea Bergman, uh, Director of Programming. I also want to formally introduce James May, who's on the call. Um, we're just going to be going back and forth and speaking to you all very formally about uh, programs um, so and and updates of what's what's coming and and also at a national level of what we can do to support chapters. So I know there's a few folks on the call that are from other chapters. So take notes, contact us if anything that we're saying is of interest to you. And we can also, uh, you know, we want to do this across the board with our supporting our chapters. Uh, so I first want to talk about the essay contest, the youth essay contest, um, and that Rebecca touched upon in her introduction. And for many years, let's just give a, a shout out to the St. Louis chapter for running this. And earlier this year, Dave proposed that, you know, that this should be at the national level. So we will be launching that soon and announcing that. Um, and we've renamed it the New Voices for Global Solutions Essay Contest. Uh, so stay tuned for updates. Um, so we'll be sharing that specifically with a St. Louis chapter for you to help spread the word. And we really want to, you know, give our young people an, an avenue, a, a way to offer solutions, to have their voices heard um, and proposing to, and their ideas, we want to put that face forward on strengthening, you know, how do we strengthen global governance? So, you know, like I said, the best essays um, we should be able to publish in Mundial, our flagship uh, publication. And then we're, uh, we really want to make this a big splash and have the winter, uh, the winner of the essay contest send them on a global governance conference. Um, so again, you know, not just looking at the conference, but how do we then create on ramps of future leaders? and get them really excited about this work that we're doing. Um, so again, thank you so much to Dave. Thank you to the St. Louis chapter for entrusting us to take uh, on your long running essay contest. So James, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Drea. Um, so we also have other exciting news, which is a new CGS National Youth Network, uh, which we'll be launching soon. CGS has a really rich history of empowering young leaders um, and the National Youth Network uh, aims to enable young people to come together to develop their skills and their knowledge about world federalism, about glo uh, uh, global governance, um, to network, uh, to join our events and workshops and online forums and other networks that we're connected to and to take action. And in doing so, we're seeking to build the next generation of CGS activists. Um, the network also tries to, will aim to um, help young people with interest in world federalism, which is quite niche at this time, to come together and build a broader coalition amongst themselves and have the opportunity to collaborate and exchange ideas and to create lasting friendships, which is something that we're very aware uh, the existing generation of CB CGS members, uh, members have together. Um, we're currently in the process of putting together an advisory group, which is comprising uh, young people from across the CGS network, as well as a few older heads uh, to guide um, the youth network uh, going into the future. We're really looking forward to launching the network. So if you know anybody who might be interested in joining, please let them know about it and put them in touch with us. Um, I'll also say a few words about our World Citizens Club, 
which is our other core youth program. Rebecca? Sorry, James, just to that point, um, to, to really like put the put the hammer on the nail there. Um, we understand that this is a transgenerational enterprise, an intergenerational enterprise, and that many of our members at CGS and indeed at WFM um, started um, with this movement or it started at different stages of this movement. It's time now for your children, your grandchildren to get involved and there are wonderful ways to do it. All the links will be in the chat and will be sent to you later. But um, this youth network, I think, would be a wonderful way to bring uh, the young people in your lives along um, the journey of uh, democratic world federal federalism. Thank you, and CGS. Thanks. Sorry. Had to do a little spunk on there. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I would second that. Um, and to say that we're really, we want to be able to generate opportunities for them to be able to work together and collaborate in the way that you have in the past and start to really grow that that next generation of activism. Um, so as I said, I will talk a little bit now about uh, the World Citizens Club, which is another one of our core programmings, uh, core, core programs. So in partnership with the World Service Authority, uh, that many of you will know David Gallup, um, who runs the World Service Authority and the Young World Federalists. Um, we have launched the World Citizens Club, which is currently running at George Mason University in Washington. Um, we would love to get more clubs up and running. The purpose of these clubs is to provide an on-ramp through activism, uh, community engagement uh, to world federalism. And um, particularly, we'd love to set one up in St. Louis. So if um, any of you have specific connections to professors at your universities who might be willing to help us establish a World Citizens Club, please let us know. Um, the current term is obviously coming to an end, but we will be looking to expand um, in the next semester. So any contacts you'd like to put our way would be welcomed. Um, Drea will put the our youth programs flyer in the in the uh, chat so you can learn a little bit more about our youth programming. Um, so please consult that. Drea, I'll hand back to you to continue. Thank you so much. And I also wanna say in addition to the flyer, um, I think a really fun thing uh, that we you all can do is that we are creating swag. So you can then share and give swag with your grandkids and your children, along with the program flyer as you know, a way to introduce CGS and ways that they can get involved. Um, so that's all, all also in the pipelines. And um, personally, as a young person, I love stickers and you cannot see my laptop. It is littered with stickers that I've been given at conferences and things like that. Um, so actually this is the, the next thing I wanna, you know, kind of move away from youth programming and more to general um, chapter uh, work that we're doing and, and more broadly programs. Um, that on June 25th, and this is from our chapter event that we held in February, uh, we're going to be then having, you know, bi-monthly advocacy campaign updates um, from Rebecca. Uh, so it's, a, again, another opportunity to get a little bit more in depth on these wonderful questions that you all had today. Um, and so this will really be, you know, for us to take that deep dive and learn what is our national and international advocacy efforts. Um, so this event will be virtual uh, and we'll have a Zoom link and a place to register so that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do a follow up with that shortly. So and this really is for CGS chapters uh, to attend, learn more, engage with us um, and uh, second, I want to talk about what's going on um, in a newly formed Cape, uh, Cape Cod and the Islands chapter, thanks to um, a CGS board member, Matt McDonough. But we will then host a new program called Community Conversations. And this is an in-person event. And it's really going to be centered around a whole weekend of uh, peace and nuclear disarmament activism. Um, as well as the launch of the chapter. Um, so again, it, it will be in person, but these are just ways that we can support chapters at the local level. Rebecca, you uh, have your hand up. Yes, just on that point, Drea, um, uh, I, in, in the context of Missouri, um, a wonderful example of 
domestic, uh, sorry, very local to domestic to international advocacy might be the fact that it was a Missouri uh, member of Congress who recently reauthorized the Atrocity Prevention Act, the Illy Weasel Act. Um, and that, and there are ways in which you can engage with your local members of Congress, with your senators on these issues uh, that have global, national, of course, but then global resonance. Um, and so in this case, it's also very interesting to me. This is a great bipartisan initiative, the Illy Weasel uh, Atrocities Prevention Act, and it's Congresswoman Ann Wagner, um, who's a Republican from Missouri who led the reauthorization um, just a few weeks ago. Um, and so we can work with local chapters on that kind of specific um, legislative action policy initiative um, to ensure that there is domestic action and then that, that it has global resonance. Sorry, Dre, I just wanted to back that up with an example. Terrific. Thank you, Rebecca. Is it okay? Sorry, uh, David, we've just got a, a few more points. Is that okay if we bat on? I know we're coming up to the end, um, so I'll be super quick. Um, as we've said before, um, we at the National Secretariat are very keen to help uh, chapters organize in-person events for members, such as talks uh, with friends of CGS, film screenings, and talks with filmmakers and readings uh, with authors of books about world federalism, about global governance and related topics. Um, We've got, uh, of course, in uh, in St. Louis, you have your very own Leila Sadat, um, who's produced a film, Never Again, uh, uh, Forging a Convention on Crimes Against Humanity. That's a great film that we could assist you put on. There are other films like A Bold Peace, Costa Rica's Path to de uh, de Demilitarization, uh, with Luis Roberto Zamora, who's a friend of CGS. We could help you put the, uh, organize the film screening, and also organize a talk uh, with Luis Roberto. And there are other films, other books, uh, as we know through Book Club, um, and talks with uh, friends and family of CGS, which would help engage uh, members of the chat of your chapters to get involved in person events that people can get together, and of course to entice new members to come on board. Um, so with that, I'll hand back to Drea um, just to close up. And I just I'll also uh, want to mention uh, the last thing about book club. Um, and I see so many wonderful um, book club participants on the line as well. We have a special session featuring Mondial, our journal, and uh, there will be featured authors that will be joining us for uh, that session. And it's on May 25th. Um, which will be 11 a.m. your time, CT time. I will put the registration for that in the link. So we hope you will be there. Um, so I just wanna say again um, uh, that we really are here to assist chapters um, in organizing events, um, being that a link between programs and what you're doing on the ground. Uh, so I'm going to put in the chat, uh, final things I'll put in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm inundating you with a lot of links today. Um, the programs page, the book club link. Um, and I just want to say thank you, everyone, for your time uh, today. It's just a joy and a privilege as always. So I'll hand it back to uh, Rebecca and Dave to close. Um, so just from my standpoint, um, this is a St. Louis chapter event. We are honored to be at your annual meeting virtually. I see that we have been joined from folks around the globe. And if there's any interest in staying on the line, would be happy to continue in an informal manner um, for a casual chat to learn some about some of our partners. Um, I, I assure you that the, the number of Brits on the call, uh, Ian and John, is not a, <laughs> oh, John dropped, I guess, um, but is not an indication that uh, that our federalism, our U.S. federalism is in any way uh, in jeopardy. But we also have friends, I think, from Armenia and elsewhere who have joined us. So that's a, a really unique um, and special opportunity. If anyone wants to stay on, I can make the time. Thank you, Rebecca, for being our guest speaker. Thank you, Drea and James, for helping me organize this particular chapter meeting. Thank you all for being a part of this meeting. I'd like to especially recognize the members of the St. Louis chapter who are on the call today. Terry Gates, 
Sister Carla Mae Streeter of the Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis, um, Seidel Scheer, Cassandra Butler, Ron Glossop, and Brian Aaron. So uh, I also would like uh, to suggest that all of you would look at uh, the St. Louis chapter's website. We have put on that a number of resources uh, that are consistent with the national uh, website, globalsolutions.org. The St. Louis website is this, and maybe Drea, you can put this in the chat for me, CGSST Lewis, so that's without any uh, periods in there, CGSST Lewis dot WordPress dot com. And uh, I'd uh, suggest all of you take a look at our local website. And if anybody would like to become a member of the St. Louis chapter, we have uh, uh, dues for of $25 annually. Uh, if you would simply contact me uh, at my web, at my email address, Auten, my last name, Auten at hotmail.com. And then I can make arrangements of how you can become a member of the St. Louis chapter. So thank you all again, and thank you, Rebecca. And anyone who wants to stay on a little longer, you're welcome to do that. Thank you all.